Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with a video. This time I'm going to go through the topic of particles and their behaviour. This will be the first chemistry topic that you will have chance to do. So I hope you really enjoy the video and I hope you gain a lot from it. The topic of particles starts by looking at what particles actually are, how particles can affect the properties of materials, and looking at why we use models to represent particles. So without further ado, uh, let's look at what a particle is. Well, in fact, what a particle is, is it's a very tiny, tiny object that makes up everything that we see and every object is made up of particles. Now, what do particles actually look like? Particles do come in many different shapes and sizes, but to keep it simple, what we do to represent particles is draw a sphere. And the reason why we draw a sphere to represent particles is because particles are extremely small. In fact, they are so, so tiny that no one can go as far as seeing one individual particle because they're so small. And that is why we use models in science. Now, the property of each material depends about the particles that it is made of. For example, if the particles are big or if they're small. For example, water particles are quite small, whereas gold particles are a lot bigger. This means that gold is a lot heavier in relation to uh, water. Also, the properties depend on how them particles move. And lastly, how the particles are arranged. We're going to look at three types of particle arrangement now. We're going to look at the particle arrangement in a solid, in a liquid, and also in a gas. Now, if you look at a solid, all the particles are arranged in neat rows and columns. And look, all the particles are touching. This means that the particles cannot move. They can only vibrate. And they will vibrate if they are heated. Also, because they can't move, solids cannot be compressed. Let's look at a liquid now. In a liquid, the particles are still touching. However, look, there are air gaps. This means that the particles are no longer in rows and columns. This means that the particles can flow past one another and slide past one another. And this means that liquids take the shape of the container that they are in. Gases are arranged differently. In gases, the particles are no longer touching and the particles are free to move. In fact, the particles movement can be described as random. As you've probably learned in class, these states of matter are not permanent. You can change the state by heating or cooling down. Going from a solid 
to a liquid is called melting. Just think about chocolate when you put it in the microwave. Going from a liquid to a gas is called evaporation. Going from a gas to a liquid is called condensation. And going from a liquid to a solid is called freezing. Now looking at these state changes, it's important to think about the energy of the particles and what is happening to the particles as I'm heating or cooling down. If I'm melting, for example, I'm giving the particles more energy. This is breaking some of the bonds and making them be able to no longer be in rows and columns. And they now have more energy to move around. In evaporation, I'm breaking the bonds completely. And this means that the particles are now free to move as free as they like. If you go the other way and you look at condensation and freezing, you're taking away the energy of them particles. The energy is becoming less and the particles are moving around less. If I was to record the temperature of something as I was to heat it up and watch it change state, I would observe this if I was to draw it on a graph. As I start to heat up something, the temperature will increase. However, it will start to flatten off, then increase again, then flatten off again, then increase again. This is called a heating curve. And the reason for the flat lines is due to the fact that here, the compound or the element is changing state. Here, it is a solid. Here, it is a liquid. And finally, it becomes a gas. And the reason you get this flat line is because it requires energy to change state. And now I know what to call the changes in state. This here, going from a solid to a liquid, is melting. And this here, going to a liquid to a gas, is called evaporating. And just think about it. Think about it in terms of the particles. It requires energy to break them bonds in order to make the particles move more. Gases and liquids have a really awesome property in the fact that they can show the property of diffusion. And this is the spreading out of particles from a region where there is lots of particles to a region where there are few. Let's look at this example below. Here I have this purple dye. Some teachers will use a substance called potassium permanganate. And when you put it in water, it starts to spread out. And here is a time lapse showing this. At the start, the potassium permanganate or dye is in a real high concentration, meaning there is lots and lots of it here. But look at it, it will start to spread out over time. Here, it's already starting to spread out. And finally, it is occupying all areas evenly. So if I was to draw out the particle diagrams for what that would look like, over here, the potassium permanganate particles would all be really, really close together. And by the end, over here, the potassium permanganate particles are spread out throughout the whole of that liquid. Diffusion can only happen in gases and liquids because the particles can move. In a solid, diffusion will never ever happen because the particles are in a fixed position. The last part of this topic looks at something called gas pressure. And this is caused by gas particles colliding with the walls of their container. Gas pressure is 
something that's quite hard to visualize because we can't see all the gas particles around us. That's why it's sometimes useful to think of gas pressure inside something that we can see. For example, a balloon or a football. Now, these contain gases. And if you think about a football, you can increase the pressure inside that ball by pumping it up, putting more air particles inside it. And you can tell that this has increased the pressure because of the fact that ball feels more pumped up. And in fact, if you put too many air particles inside that football, it will pop. You can also change the pressure inside the football by heating the football up or by cooling it down. This is because of the fact that those gas particles are moving around inside that football. And in fact, if you've ever played football on a really cold day, you might notice that the football is a little bit more flat. So let's imagine if I was to heat that football up. Well, the particles are going to move a lot faster. This is going to cause more collisions with the walls of the container and thus the gas pressure will increase as well. And the last way you can increase the pressure is you can reduce the volume. Just think about it. This balloon here, if I was to stand on that balloon and decrease the volume that the, that air could be in, that pressure is going to increase more and that will mean that it could pop in fact, okay? So look, they're going to collide with the walls of the container more because there's less space for it to occupy. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember that if you did, please remember to like the video and please subscribe to my channel.